Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Monica Wedlock Kilpatrick and I serve as the Associate Vice President for Organizational Development of the National Benevolent Association of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. As we get started, I would like to inform you that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on the MBA website at mbacares.org slash prison dash and dash jail. This webinar is part of our 2020 MBA webinar series. Today's topic is the prison abolition movement, eliminating the prison industrial complex. The coronavirus pandemic has certainly shed light upon the weaknesses and flaws of the correction system in the United States. It is time to explore alternatives to a system that has evolved into mass incarceration and disproportionately affecting people of color. The prison abolition movement has many fa facets worth exploring. Dr. Jason Williams, Assistant Professor of Justice Studies at Montclair State University, will lead this important webinar and, dis and discussion as the church explores alternatives to our broken correction system. This webinar can be used as a tool for discussion and call to action in congregations, regions, and general church ministries. At the end of this presentation, there will be time for questions. Throughout the webinar, if you have a question that emerges, we welcome you to use the Q&A feature by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions. Please include your email address so that if we are unable to get to your question, we can follow up with you directly after the webinar is over. To request technical assistance, you may also use the Q&A feature. And again, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available for future viewing on the MBA website. To begin, let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Jason Williams, as I mentioned, is the Assistant Professor of Justice Studies at Montclair State University. He's, passionate, he's a passionate activist, criminologist, deeply concerned about racial disparity and mistreatment within the criminal justice system. Dr. Williams is a New Jersey native raised by his grandmother in a housing project, which ultimately led him to pursue a doctorate in the administration of justice from Texas Southern University. Aside from publishing in the academic arena, his perspectives are also posted on several public outlets, including the Hampton Institute and Truth Out. He's conducted ethnographic research in Baltimore, Maryland and Ferguson, Missouri, following the police involved tragedies of Freddie Gray and Michael Brown. He's also engaged research around returning citizens and how they navigate re-entry and the prison. Dr. Williams is most, cert most concerned about the punitive effects of the criminal justice system imposes upon marginalized populations. He has been invited at Old Dominion University, Yale University, and other institutions to lecture on some of the topics mentioned above. Dr. Williams is also deeply entrenched in community work as he serves on the board of two major organizations in New Jersey and actively works with others for a change in the administration of justice. We thank you for being with us, Dr. Williams. Thank you, thanks for having me. We also have Reverend Dean Bucalis, as you know, is the mission specialist for the NBA Prison and Jail Ministries. He was ordained in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and has served as the pastor of congregations in Kentucky, Illinois, and Indiana. He's the founding and former pastor, pastor of New Life in Christ, Christian Church uh, Disciples of Christ, a congregation he began inside a women's reentry facility in Louisville, Kentucky. Dean is also the executive director of Mission Behind Bars and Beyond, an ecumenical reentry program that trains small faith-based groups to work with returning citizens upon their release from prison. MB3, as we call it, is also an MBA incubate and connect partner. Dean will moderate some of the conversation, um, and so we're grateful to have you as well, Dean. And at this time, I'll turn it over to you, Dean, to begin. Thank you, Monica. We are delighted to have Dr. Williams with us to be a part of this webinar series. Uh, this is an important topic, and I think one of the reasons we wanted to uh, bring this before uh, our congregations and congregation members was because the uh, the recent pandemic has really uh, illustrated some of the deficiencies in our criminal justice system, particularly in the correction system. 
We know that there are a number of uh, individuals who are residents of both prisons and jails who are confined and are subjected to um, COVID-19 without much relief. Um, and some of this is the result of a, uh, a growing uh, dysfunctional correction system that has been in place for a number of years. So this is a good time for us to begin examining not only that and how it's become dysfunctional, but also the evolution of that and what could, can become in the future so that we can do things differently in a more just and humane way. Uh, the prison abolition movement has been one that is, is around for a number of years, but is beginning to get more traction because we're understanding that change needs to be made in our correction system. And this may be the right time to visit that. So we want our church members and followers of Jesus Christ to be able to better understand this topic so we can be equipped to be part of the solution as we move forward in addressing this um, serious problem. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dr. Williams. Um, we are, as I mentioned, very privileged to have him join us uh, and we look forward to his presentation this afternoon. Thank you, thank you. Um, if I can just have someone to um, share their screen because I'm not able to do it on this end. Um, to bring up the presentation, thank you. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, so. So once again, um, thank you all so much for the invitation to come here today and to present on this very, very important topic. Um, like I said, it's just an honor and I'm very happy and overjoyed that as a collective, you guys are looking into this, right? At least looking to learn a little bit about it and hence why I titled it Prison Abolition, A Brief Introduction. So what I wanna try and do here today is for the most part, bring before you a girth of information and sort of its brief context as I can. I always try to stay brief, but I always end up still going in depth too at the same time. That's the professor in me, I guess. But sort of bring into you uh, the case for abolition and then going into, you know, what that might look like and then the importance of sustained uh, activism, community and political engagement and what, whatever have you, followed by the Q&A, which I certainly look forward to. So the reasons for abolition. So in this presentation, you'll notice that I talk about three major reasons. And I think that when you encapsulate much of the literature, whether it be academic literature or um, activist literature or whatnot, around uh, abolition, the exclamations are pretty much grounded in what you see right here, these three major reasons, which is the prison as an epidemiological disaster, right? Dean mentioned the COVID outbreak. And I'm sure we've all watched the news stories about how COVID pretty much permeated all of our prisons. Um, the prison as a technology of racialized uh, and class and gender sexual control and the horrors that comes along with that. And you'll see some reports later in the presentation in which I contextualize this particular egregious harm that is so heavily associated with the American prison. But then also the prison as an institution of capitalist neoliberal accommodation and profiteering. So here we're talking about the utter and literal commodification of human flesh. And here as abolitionists, we like to ask the question as to whether or not justice should play a role in the commodification of human flesh. So as we go throughout this presentation, to the left of the slide, you'll see books that I feel are pertinent to the discussion. Feel free to uh, screenshot those or to write down the titles as fast as you can, um, because these books are, I think, foundational and very, very important. I just didn't have enough time to really throw them into the um, presentation, <clears throat> but want it nonetheless for you to see them. So moving into the first major reason, the uh, epidemiological context here, 
Drucker, in his wonderful book, The Plague of Prisons, has already articulated to us, right, the extent to which the prison is a major social determinant of poor health. It is an incubator of all kinds of diseases, communicable diseases, such as STDs, right, other kinds of blood-borne and transferable-based diseases, but then also autoimmune diseases. So, for instance, the fact that people um, are likely to develop, for instance, heart disease and diabetes and other such diseases within the prisons. And then not also to mention uh, the egregious levels of mental instability and mental disease that comes about as a result of one stay within the prison. And we're not only talking about long-term stay within the prison, but perhaps even just a night or two within any American prison or jail, right? So, and so even when you think about mental disease, which often is a sort of silent abnormality, right? These two are incubators. These two are uh, most egregious harms that are also associated with the prison. And the effects of prison-based disease is exacerbated by its uneven impact. So for instance, you know, people of color are by and largely already sort of dealing with many of these health abnormalities. The fact that many of them are already going to prison with mental health concerns or with autoimmune disease and such. And yet when they get inside the prison, these issues are exacerbated. So if we look here at some of the data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. This data comes from 2011 through 2012. This is the latest available data, unfortunately, from the National Inmate Survey. The prevalence here in figure one of ever having a chronic condition or infectious disease among state and federal prisoners and jail inmates here, we see that for both prisoners and jail inmates, they go toe to toe as far as chronic conditions. And so what I'm thinking right now in this current moment in which we are living with the COVID crisis and how COVID is more likely to you know, inflict those with chronic conditions, I'm wondering, well, is the current prison, is the prison as we know it today, as it is currently constructed, is it something that is in fact necessary? Is it is something that is saving lives, that is keeping lives safe? I would have to think perhaps not. Um, and, for, and really, is the prison perhaps the uh, most suitable place for someone with chronic health abnormality? If we move over to figure three, the rate of ever having a chronic condition amongst jail inmates, and here at 20, uh, 2002 and 2011 through 2012, here you see um, major differences between the years. And so I'm just gonna read a bit from the data here. The 2011 through 2012 rate of jail inmates who reported ever having diabetes was twice the 2002 rate. And this is again based on uh, 361 per 10,000 inmates. And the rate of high blood pressure in 2011 through 2012 was almost 1.5 times higher than the rate in 2002. The rate of asthma also rose between 2002 and 2011 through 2012 from 1,500 per 10,000 inmates to a little over 2,000 per 10,000 inmates. So, you know, we can all take guesses as to why, you know, those rates changed over time or whatever have you, but as we will see later in the presentation, perhaps on the next slide or two, um, the prison, you know, with its poor ventilation systems and poor construction and such and the literal warehousing of bodies on top of one another certainly um, encourages, right, the rising rates of some of these chronic diseases. And if you look at table four here, you can see between state and federal prisoners and jail inmates here under chronic diseases, and I'm here looking at hypertension and multiple chronic diseases, you see here, um, for instance, with the multiple, they're pretty much on par with one another, right, with multiple chronic conditions. And again, I'm thinking in this moment of COVID in which we are living, right? And, and there weren't many governors who, who decided to do the right thing, right, and let some of these individuals out and such you know, so that they would not contract COVID, which again appears to be more attracted to individuals with chronic abnormality. If you look at infectious disease, multiple uh, infectious diseases here, um, obviously we see that state and federal prisoners um, are up just a few points from the jail inmates. And then if you go down a little bit further, you see the rates for hepatitis B and C, which are pretty high, might I add, for the incarcerated population. And, you know, according to much of the research, these individuals, most of them will come home. And so now we have to contend with community spread of some of these diseases, 
that were um, sort of metastasized, if you will, within the prison itself. And so when we think about the prison as an epidemiological disaster, I think it is, it's, it's crucial that you also implant within those discussions the prison as an incubator of disease, both visible disease, but also invisible disease, as we mentioned earlier, with regards to mental health disorders. From this same report, both prisoners and jail inmates uh, were more likely than a general population to report ever having a chronic condition. And why might that have been the case, right? I'm thinking in terms of qualitative frameworks here. Um, could it have been perhaps the architectural uh, atmosphere of the prison, you know, that forced them to come more into awareness as to what their conditions perhaps were? Um, about 66% of the prisoners and 40% of jail inmates with chronic condition reported taking prescription medication. But if we pause really quickly and just speak in parenthetical terms here, there are many jurisdictions in which prisoners, believe it or not, have to pay for their medication. They have to pay for their medication. And so if you are an indigent prisoner, how are you going to pay for your medication? Um, you know, there are reports of prisoners rationing their medication inside, similarly to those on the outside, right? Impoverished individuals on the outside who cannot afford medication. So imagine how compounded, right, or exacerbated these issues are for those inside the prison. And again, in a moment of COVID, you know, most epidemiologists will tell us that moments such as now are likely to re reoccur. You know, we just have to be better prepared for them. Um, white, uh, while female prisoners and jail inmates were less likely than males to be overweight, they were also more likely to be obese or morbidly obese. So we need to think a little bit about whether or not our prisons are even geared to be able to respond to some of these major health crises, right, that inflict our prisons. And if you look at most of the case law regarding in-prison health care, you might find that they simply are not. Now, there are some differences between public versus private, right? But each institution has been sued quite, quite a lot of times, you know, due to poor health outcomes in their healthcare systems. And TB, I put on the slide here because there's just a lot more information known about it. But according to the World Health Organization, uh, TB in prisons is almost 100 times more, right, more likely in there than in the civilian population. And uh, in, in fact, prison cases of this disease, right, accounts for nearly 25% of all cases, and this is due mostly to late diagnoses, inadequate treatment, and so forth and so on. And this, of course, too, due to the fact that prisons are just grossly, grossly uh, underdeveloped in terms of their healthcare uh, capabilities, um, and then overcrowding. And then also another factor here is the um, repeated transferring of inmates between different institutions. And then sort of broader to that is the fact that some research even indicate that, look, life expectancies right, decreased life expectancy is also associated with that of incarceration. All of this goes to the epidemiological disaster argument against prisons. And although incarcerated individuals are, like I mentioned earlier, likely to have some health abnormality upon reaching incarceration, a lot of research has identified the extent to which incarceration worsens many of the conditions that they're coming in with. So even in my own research around returning citizens, I find that many of their, for instance, mental health abnormality is worsened as a result of their stay in prison or jail. And then of course, coming back home and having to face all kinds of discriminations through law or custom. So re research has also identified that there are grave racial disparities in access to substance and mental health care treatment because of the lack of funding in particular uh, geographies and particularly those geographies that are attached to people of color and other marginalized bodies. And so when you consider all of that, facilities throughout our country have become places that subject many of our own citizens, people with whom we live, right, our neighbors, to immense violence and trauma. And violence, not only in the physical sense, meaning that, oh, this person had a knife or a gun and they, you know, they, you, I can feel the physical pain, if you will. But like I mentioned, even the sort of silence diseases, such as like mental disorders that might develop by use of uh, the indiscriminate use of solitary confinement. So moving into the prison as a technology of racialized class and gender 
uh, control. Um, this is very important to look at as well because the prison plays a very peculiar functionality in terms of how the social order is, you know, is said to, 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 to go or is said to um, be administered, if you will. Um, and here's another good book. Hope, I hope people are paying attention to the books to the left here, or my left anyway. But um, according to scores of research, of course, race continues to be a major determining factor, right, when it comes to punishment in our country. And Blacks, of course, the foremost targets of racist penal logics. Uh, the nature of this reality is also intersectional, meaning that we have to consider the differences even within race categories, you know, class, gender, sexuality, and so forth. Uh, economically challenged whites are also increasingly finding themselves under lockdown for precisely some of the same offenses that blacks were, um, black and brown individuals were incarcerated for in the late 80s, moving into the 90s. And so we're seeing this shift in the administration of justice and social control logics. And when we look here, and again, I think this data too, um, but the latest available data from this source, uh, 2014, based on 2014 dollars, here we can see the sort of economic disparities, right? The association between those who find themselves uh, in the prison or coming in contact with our systems of social control and their economic standing. And of course, over here for the men, you see the digits for blacks, right? So incarcerated blacks, you have here annual income at about 17,000. For Hispanics, 19,000. For white males, you have 21. And for all, 19. For women, black women, you have about 12,000. For Hispanic, 11,000. For white, about 15. And all, 13. And so you can see how our criminal justice system for the most part is also geared to pretty much target the poorest amongst us. And so from an abolitionist standpoint, we would have to question or at least problematize the extent to which, um, you know, is that truly justice? You know, is justice targeting the poorest amongst us? And when we look at some of the offenses that are accounted for within our um, social control or the prison industrialization complex, frankly, um, you know, many of these offenses, and I'm so sorry if you guys can't see and I tried to stretch this out as much as I can. Um, many of these offenses are associated with people um, who are on the lower economic ladder, right? So for instance, you know, having to go out and sell drugs because of being economically deprived or even some of the uh, robbery offenses and different things of that sort, which I'm sure we'll get into in a Q&A session. Um, but anywho, much of people's pathways into criminality has much to do with their social and political positioning within our broader social structure, you know? But the way in which our administration of justice is sort of positioned now, or at least the way in which it adjudicates justice, it is such that it pays absolutely no attention to those other and very, very, very important factors. Unless you are um, the kid out of Texas who was able to use the affluenza defense. Um, now, pre-trial risk assessment tools are also a tremendous obstacle, particularly against minoritized individuals, right? We had bail reform here in New Jersey. I know there were some other such states that um, attempted at this as well. But I want to read this quote here from the Civil Rights Org, where they state, quote, algorithms being applied nationwide are uh, <clears throat> widely varied in design, complexity, and inputs, including cutting edge techniques like machine learning. And machine learning is the process by which rules are developed from observations of patterns and training data. And as a result, biases in the data sets will not only be replicated in the results, they may actually be exacerbated. For example, since police officers disproportionately arrest people of color, criminal justice data used for training the tools will perpetuate this correlation. Therefore, <clears throat> as I add here, such control mechanisms not only impact minoritized individuals en masse, but people, they set precedent for disadvantaged poor whites as well. Because look, if, it, if, they, if they see that it works on this population and then soon wants to target you, then they're setting precedent for how eventually this system, this new program of social control can impact us all. And for the bulk of those who are on the uh, lower classes, you know, and find themselves entrapped into this system, 
right, this increasingly carnivorous penal system, they appear frankly at the mercy of technocrats and economically well-off justice overseers. Because from an abolitionist standpoint, certainly we feel the need to question the intentionality of both the entire system, but often to the workers within. Poor people have no agency within the American legal system as evidenced by the former slides. Implications around the right to counsel and such are more symbolic than realized. And I know we talk about Gideon versus Wainwright, you know, the landmark Supreme Court case that was said to grant people some right to counsel or what have you. But let's be very clear here about the um, efficiency, if you will, of public defenders offices and how they continue to be overburdened with cases they lack financial support um, to fully, you know, investigate on behalf of their uh, clients, you know. And then, of course, this goes into also being uh, incapable of fully litigating their cases. Uh, and the disjointedness, frankly, with which public defender offices operate is also discouraging. And it makes it harder for researchers from whatever stripe, you know, whether you're a legal scholar, criminologist, sociologist, or whatever have you. Um, it makes it harder for people to fully understand what's going on here, you know? And I guess parenthetical to the Gideon versus Wainwright thing and thinking a little bit more historical and historically and intersectional, I guess what's really interesting about this is that, well, Gideon was a white man, right? And so maybe within the larger context of um, the white supremacist nature of construction of American jurisprudence, perhaps, the feeling is that, well, the right to an attorney was granted to white males. Jason, I'd like to go back to a, a, a point that you made and ask a question. Yes. So you've um, you've described the prison and jail system as really an incubation um, location for um, illness and disease. That uh, it, it seems to be a place where um, poor health, um, disease, um, illness is uh, is is prevalent and almost rampant. Um, and now we know that um, a significant number of people who are incarcerated uh, are going to be returning to our uh, to our uh, communities. I've, you know, in Kentucky, I think it's 95% of the people who have been incarcerated will be returning at some point in time to our communities. And now, uh, with the overpopulation of our jail po uh, of our jail facilities. A lot of those folks will be um, in this unhealthy environment and coming back into our communities. What, what's the impact on on public health with respect to yeah. um, to all these people returning to our yeah. communities? Yeah, yeah. Well, you have the threat of potential community spread, right? And we've seen this. So people are coming out with. HIV or hepatitis and different other kinds of diseases, you have obviously community spread of those diseases. But these are the more sort of visible diseases that we can kind of see and know about. I think the more silent ones would be if a person is coming out with a kind of mental disorder that then enables this person to come out and act out in aggressive ways in the family unit, right? Um, this is just as important to pay close attention to. And again, inextricably tied to the um, their stay in prison, right? You cannot disconnect the two, if you will. Um, so it's, it's a grave concern and public health scholars and public health advocates have been talking about this for quite some time. So that's a great, great question to bring to the table, Dean. Thank you. Yes. Um, as we continue on, uh, you know, there has been a lot of talk around recidivism, right? And a prison um, policy initiative has a really good um, report around this. And I know Jeremy Travis and some of his work has long been questioning, uh, well, why is it that we, you know, utilize, and this is within the community corrections arena, you know, with technical violations and so forth and so on. But even more broadly, um, how do we sort of quali qualitatively decompartmentalize um, recidivism, if you will? You know, and as you see here, if state level advocates and political leaders want to know if their state is even trying to reduce recidivism, they suggest that, you know, one easy litmus test, do they collect and publish basic data about the number and causes of people's interactions with the justice system while on probation or after release from 
prison. And so, in other words, we don't even really know like the qualitative reasons behind why people might re-engage or whatever have you. We're just looking at whether or not they were recommitted or whether or not they were able to um, desist. And, you know, and then in terms of the technical violations, um, you know, curfew, dirty urine, so forth and so on. But the main question here is again, well, what do we learn? What, what are we actually getting from this? Is it making us safe, you know? Or are we just continuing uh, to warehouse, right? Are we adding to the warehousing of citizens? So recidivism data do not support the belief that people who commit violent crimes ought to be locked away for decades, right? Um, and we want to think about how this, you know, forces us to put more taxpayer dollars also, right, into this system, the sort of largesse, if you will. People convicted of violent and sexual offenses are actually the least likely to reoffend. Right? And a lot of this too has to do with the sort of aging out of crime um, phenomenon as well. But more broadly, people who are convicted of violent crimes are less likely to be rearrested in the years after release than those convicted of what might be considered the more lower level offenses. So like property, drug, or, or, or public order offenses and such. Am I right yeah. in, um, in concluding that uh, over a quarter of the population of our jails and prisons are uh, from people who have had technical violations, um, as you mentioned. Yes. Uh, and so they haven't committed a new crime. Yes. They, they've, they've just upset someone because they haven't followed a particular rule. Yes. Yeah. And so the question I, from the last slide, and a lot of the scholars who've done work around that is, well, what are we actually getting from that, right? So, because when the criminal justice system steps in, it should be in the name of public safety. So we should be doing something to ensure that the public is being right protected. But if this person is being recommitted because they perhaps missed a curfew or didn't come to see their probation officer, parole officer, I mean, what exactly are we getting out of sending this person back to prison? And then let us not forget the epidemiological right, implications here. The fact that you might be sending somebody into a place in which they are going to fall seriously ill, right? And so again, and then also, the correctional officers and the other workers within the prison, let's not forget how they too, right, are at severe risk of contracting all of those diseases since they too have to be under those roofs. So moving into um, investigation, the investigation of the Etna Man prison, this is our only women's prison here in New Jersey, uh, the DOJ found grave eight amendment uh, violations at this prison. And I'm just going to briefly go through some of the findings here. And this, I think, really speaks quintessentially to the gender sexual control, um, although there is much more even just beyond this here, this example. But over the course of their visit, they interviewed um, NJ Doc and uh, Aetna Man administrator staff, security staff, medical and mental health staff, as well as prisoners. And what they found was that the prison fails to protect women prisoners from sexual abuse by staff in violation of the Eighth Amendment, and that they expose women prisoners to substantial risk of serious harm from sexual abuse in violation of that amendment. Sexual abuse of women prisoners by Aetna Man correctional officers and staff is severe, and it is prevalent throughout the prison. They state that, quote, a culture of acceptance of sexual abuse has persisted for many years and continues to be present. Substantiated incidents of staff sexual abuse of prisoners at Aetna Man are varied and disturbing. Some staff abuse prisoners through unwanted co or sexual contact or sexual penetration. In other instances, prisoners were forced to perform fellatio on, on or touch the intimate body parts of staff. And some of the substantiated incidents of sexual abuse at Aetna Man. One of the officers would take a prisoner behind the cage to commit sexual abuse while the other officer acted as a lookout. And so, again, one example, right? But what we do know through various media reports and accountings, as well as narratives of those who have been there, done that, right? And other sources, this is a rampant problem within the American prison system. Rampant, rampant. And while we do pay very close attention to many of our women's prisons, we should, very, we should note, right, that this is happening in male prisons as well. And sometimes even within 
you know, the inmate population. And so this do this too plays a role in the sort of social controlling of your of gender and sexuality and such. Um, you can feel free to look this report up. You can just Google the name here, screenshot that, and you can look it up. There are um, all kinds of results in there that I think bears any and everyone looking at. But it certainly lays the groundwork for why prisons as they are constructed just simply don't need to be. Um, now, moving into processes of reentry, because we tend to look at sometimes this sort of community-based um, reactions to the individuals coming home as the, the solution or whatnot, right? But as my good friend, Jennifer Ortiz, who um, is associated too with the group, um, had lamented in one of her articles, we might need to problematize that as well because the reentry complex, is the reentry industrial complex is something that um, has to begin to sort of engage in the dehumanization of their quote unquote clients. Um, mothers of color face unique battles around parenting in a child welfare surveillance state in particular, right? As they navigate reentry processes, because again, the reentry processes have increasingly become punitive. And this is, a, this is supposed to be a period in which you are reentering society. You are trying to get back to that which you were. And yet by law and custom, many of these mothers find themselves being completely excluded, completely excluded, right? Uh, the outcome of these vicious programs corroborates already existing stereotypes, right? Already existing stereotypes that have been further manufactured and, and, and these further manufactured barriers and inequalities about black women. And this is something that I know Janet Garcia Hallett writes about in her latest piece um, about how when they come out, while even while they're trying to change themselves and, and, and get back to their um, families and such, it is these pervasive negative stereotypes that society uses to further exclude them, you know? And this is a sort of intersectional and necessary and intersectional look at how these, um, how these barriers affect uh, black women in particular. Um, while fathers of color, on the other hand, will tend to battle issues around masculinity, right? And, and, and the insurmountable child support bills or whatnot. And it's important that we sort of couch this masculinity crisis as well, because what it does is it creates all kinds of, I mean, dire mental health abnormality, dire. Um, and this is something that we must pay very close attention to. And then as Bahia Muhammad always argue, children are ultimately denied childhoods, denied the right to grow up and be a child, right? Uh, denied their parental figures while remaining resilient against all odds, having to matriculate life literally on your own. And so the prison as an institution of capitalist neoliberal accommodation and profiteering, um, and here we have Ruthie's book here. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the commodification of justice through the use of living flesh cannot be understated. We have to contextualize this, right, within abolitionist uh, talks. And certainly the historicity of this program of profiteering goes back to slavery. It goes back to slavery and even into the convict leasing system as the boy um, eloquently captured in much of his work. Um, yet today, imprisonment of mostly black and Latinx bodies are fueling the economies of mostly white rural prison towns, right? Aiding in what, you know, Mauer and Chesley Lynn had called the rural growth economies, right? And, and this is sort of part of the project of racial capitalism, right? As well, in a sense, you know, uplifting previously poor white sectors to the complete utter detriment of equally, similarly, equally and similarly situated uh, counterparts, if you will. This is how you keep them divided and separate from one another, you know? Vukant, on the other hand, argues that the increasing use of uh, incarceration is directly connected to market-driven aspirations of a workforce that actually knows its place. You know, he laments that not only is the prison a holding cell for surplus populations, because increasingly now, you know, with um, certain industries shutting down and, you know, un unemployment numbers jumping through the roof, right, we have surplus populations, you know, disposed bodies. It is now a tool the prison in concert with private industry to guarantee compliant low class workers, to guarantee compliant low class workers. So it serves as a mechanism through which to pluck us back in order. 
And by the way, if you're unable to get back in order on the outside, we can put you to work on the inside. And reductions, he states, in the welfare state um, more than guarantees the manufacturing of this perfect marriage between the state uh, punishment regimes and private industry, and private industry. Um, under neoliberal justice, citizens are punished based on their lack of self-responsibility. This is part of the sort of neoliberal, um, the, the emergence, if you will, to a neoliberal conservative uh, ideology in the 80s that really helped to spark some of the get tough on, you know, uh, uh, on crime um, policies in the 80s going into the 90s as well. And under these ideologies, of course, macro level factors, right, institutional level factors became completely irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Look at this example, for instance, Amy Kaufman from ProPublica. Um, the digital jail, how electronic monitoring drives defendants into debt. You know, this is part of the new e incarceration uh, movement, if you will, which again, will have some to believe that this is more progressive because you're not incarcerating people behind prison walls or, or, or jail walls or whatnot, at least they're going back home or whatnot. But I would, I would caution us to think a little bit about how perhaps being incarcerated in one's home is a bit more egregious, you know, to be sitting here and to be able to see outside my window and know that I can't go out there, right, is, is a bit more egregious when you think about the mental context here. But Dewan White walked free on October 12th or so he thought she states he was 19 years old sitting in the St. Louis medium security uh, institution. He had no previous convictions, but the $1,500 that he needed for bond was far beyond what he could afford. He, uh, it wasn't until his public defender made the argument to lower it to $500 that then a nonprofit stepped in and paid it for him. And this was a notoriously grim jail, she notes. Judge Nicole Corbett Botchway had ordered him to wear an ankle monitor. So this is a new thing now, you know, we're gonna put ankle monitors on everybody, you know, and then the companies that are, you know, uh, contracted with the county, you know, as you see here, would get $10 a day from these, uh, from the, from the um, clients, because that's what they call them to sort of humanize them, um, even though that doesn't do the job, but he would be required to pay $10 a day to a private company, Eastern Missouri Alternative Sentence and Services. Um, just to get the monitor attached, he would have to report to this company and pay $300 up front, uh, enough to cover the first 25 days, plus a $50 installment fee. However, when he got home, he was so immersed in being able to see his family, he was being human, human, something that unfortunately the current system, you know, has no way in which to connect. Um, he spent the next few days hanging out with his siblings, his mother who had returned, right? She wanted to see her son, but then also with his girlfriend, Demetria, who had been pregnant. So he was not able to make it to EMAS. But however, while being stopped on an unrelated issue, he found out he had a warrant. And yes, as you can imagine, the warrant was for failing to show up and he was sent back. Uh, when pressured to pay the $300 for her son, Thompson, his mother, felt that the court was forcing her to choose between him and the rest of her family. And so this is a crisis and frankly, a violence, a most egregious violence that mothers of color, particularly in ghettoized neighborhoods, are forced to confront day in, day out. Do I care for my kids that I have at home? or do I let him sit in this building that I know is also likely to kill him? I fear for him on the streets, but then I fear for him while he is in the hands of the state. Feel free to look at so What I hear you saying is that some of the folks who are proponents of releasing people from places of incarceration are actually profiting from right. the, um, the use of these ankle bracelets where they're making money. Uh, so we, we need to be careful when we listen to the voices of people who That's right. are uh, proposing uh, prison release because it's um, in this capitalistic system, they have found an angle in which they can make money. 
Yes, and this was led, spearheaded by ALEC, right? A, a conservative think tank organization that came up with ways in which to propagandize these ways of, you know, hijacking, if you will, progressive movements, right? And, and procedures even. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, as I mentioned in approaching that section, the commodification of human flesh in the name of so-called justice is nothing short of evil. Um, people should not be able to profit off the commodification of justice. Um, that that should, should have always been a no-no to us, but it's not something that is particularly new, right? Du Bois had written about the convict leasing system, uh, but then also slavery, right, as a technology of social control in which, right, the state and the system um, profited off the commodification of human flesh. So we should always be, if we're conscious and trying to move beyond our past, we should always be, you know, ever conscious about these processes of trying to exploit bodies, you know, and then when, when, when they're doing it in the name of justice, I just think, you know, that, that is most egregious, most egregious, uh, most egregious. Because again, in, in the context of individuals who are cycling out of jails in particular, they have not been adjudicated yet, right? So some of these people may very well be innocent. They may very well be innocent. And yet, the experience of having to navigate this E incarceration, as they call it, is something that cannot be erased. It cannot be erased. And, you know, there's research around this. So these individuals might not be able to get jobs. There is stigma that is associated with this. And again, if in the long run, it pans out that you were in fact innocent, how do you get that back? You can't in many, in many respects. You just simply can't. So the impact of the three reasons are multidimensional um, insofar that each does tremendous damage in grotesquely comprehensive ways that makes it hard for us to truly quantify the reach of American punitiveness. Yes, we have numbers. We can go to federal, federal um, sources and state sources and such and look at the numbers, but the grotesqueness at which the system operates, right? The reach is so far deep down in. I mean, it goes into crevices that we have yet to even discover that it makes it so hard for us to quantify what really is happening here. And this is why it's, you know, it's very important to raise up qualitative research as well. You know, qualitative understandings and knowledges around what it must be like to navigate the landscapes of American punitiveness. Racial, class, and gender implications continue to be necessarily complicated by our ever-expanding awareness of these categories, right? Yet, the systems are not amendable to these knowledges. So I'm thinking about, you know, um, trans individuals, right, and the violence that they face behind bars, you know? And we have to think about how the status quo functionality here within the current system feeds off binaries and collapse in illiteracies around social categorization and reality for that matter because this is what protects the status quo in particular, right? So it is not amendable to expanding its knowledge bank around these newly developing ways of knowing. Under the current system, American punitiveness is carnivorous. Its, ex its exploitative contours are reaching bounds beyond control. For instance, the private detention facilities that are harboring people who have been labeled undocumented, right? Um, or even the private uh, probation officers or private police um, services and such. And while many may not see themselves as victims, the mere operation uh, of such an illegitimate, human-destroying, injustice-pumping system makes us all less safe as a collective, you know, for all of the reasons I mentioned earlier. But it also does grave moral harm, as I mentioned here, and physical harm to our society because these people will come home. They will come home. And Dean, your question earlier as to the um, health abnormality, right? They will come home and whatever they've experienced inside the system will inevitably spread to the rest of us. So if they're victims, so are we, and therefore it must go, it must go. So very quickly when we're unpacking um, abolition, um, what we're talking here, because I know some people limit it to just the um, criminality of people or what have you, but we're talking about fundamental societal change. It must be instituted in concert with abolishing racist, classist, sexist, inhumane punishment regimes. We must admit that the use of the um, well, we must admit 
We must admit via the use of well-established facts, excuse me, that prisons and jails have failed and they've been designed by and large to do so. Again, with the profit um, aspirations now, I would say overtly attached nowadays, right? The neoliberalist takeover of justice, for instance, um, they are most certainly designed to, to fail. So we're not rehabilitating individuals and by extension, we're not keeping society safe. We're, we're just simply not. Um, and even if individuals are, for instance, when we think about the population of those who, um, as I mentioned on the slides, who commit some of the more violent crimes and how they're least likely to reoffend, okay, yes, they may not have such high recidivism rates, but what about the mental health abnormalities that they have lingering within? Is that not a threat to society? Or should we not, not so much so that it's a threat, but is that not something that we should also be dealing with, you know, we shouldn't be limiting our sort of traditional discourses around uh, correctional control to just whether or not this person committed a crime or whatnot, right? And this is why I say that often we tend to see these people as disposed bodies, right? Well, well, you've been labeled a criminal. Once you get out, we don't even have to care about you because who are you anyway, right? But no, these individuals sit docilely. They sit there now with all of these sort of uh, abnormalities building up within them. And there are neighbors, there are friends, there are families and such. We understand that there is a difference between its theoretical purpose, the prison, and how it functions in practice. So going back to the three reasons, right? The Department of Corrections or Rehabilitation, but we know that it's not doing that, unfortunately. And there is no logic in, to punishment regimes, recidivism, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, for some smaller offenses remain high and returning citizens report not being rehabilitated. And the experience becomes cyclical, right? So people just go in and out, in and out, or induced into states of nothingness and homelessness. And I'm just not so certain that that is justice either. Um, so we need to think about these multi, the multidimensional effects on this, you know, the breakdown between how these affect Blacks versus, you know, Latinx versus Native Americans versus white, so forth and so on. And then also sexuality, identity, and all of that. Prison populations are reflective of racist targeting in the criminal laws, as one of the sources mentioned earlier. Um, but then also within policing, as Alex Vitale reminds us. Um, which is the sort of first step before we get to the prison. Moreover, the same is true in prosecutorial decision-making processes, right? We need to begin to think about ways in which to abolish that as well, right? And, and judge and jury decision-making processes. And, and, and more importantly, even at the juvenile levels, you know, when you look at the numbers for juvie justice, unfortunately, they mirror that of the adult system. They mirror that of the adult system. Racist, sexist, homo, and transphobic, viol transphobic violence inside prisons cannot be tolerated either, right? They are also incubators for unmentionable kinds of violences against marginalized individuals, particularly sexually marginalized individuals. Neither should solitary confinement or sexual violence be uh, uh, occurring. These acts are immoral. They are against Eighth Amendment protections and broader human rights treaties and conventions and customs. And yet U.S. prisons reproduce these, har these harms day in, day out. There are, I mean, look, I read the one report and there are additional reports that substantiates these as well. Um, and just to speed up, you know, healthy communities will have far less crime and interpersonal tensions if we um, propose full-scale investments by way of community-based programs, right? The community knows what it needs for itself. Social services, healthcare, housing, food, education, and et cetera. Abolition calls for restructuring, the restructuring of ideologies around caring for the community. We seek to build uh, innovative restorative justice models that will return power back to the hands of the community to adjudicate tension. There are groups in place and, and systems in place now that have shown to be, and I hate to use the term evidence-based, right, but they have shown to work. The community knows itself better than parasitic paternalistic overseers and institutions that have shown to not have its best interests. And I think most important is how this will bring about true democratic inclusion, particularly for communities that have never felt included to begin with, that have always had to live under these sort of paternalistic frameworks, particularly of white supremacy, right? And so democratic engagement comes from the genuine inclusion of all voices. You know, we all have a right to say how we want to be governed, and this includes processes of justice. 
right? We have a right as a community to say that, no, we want to be adjudicated this way, or we want to uh, have restorative justice models as opposed to this traditional punitive model that really doesn't see the humanity of the members of our community, irrespective to whether or not they hurt us. So justice must be foregrounded in intersectional frameworks that understand the personhood of all human beings. It mustn't be colorblind. Our current system is colorblind. It is gender blind. Um, and it must, and it, and it, or, or simply even behaves in ways that claim to be neutral, right? A justice system that is value neutral or that doesn't see people or humans is one that is completely illegitimate. Completely illegitimate. True justice is accommodating to all realities um, that exist. And it does not shell out hypocrisies of safeguarding humanity while also ignoring it, right? So you can't say that you're here to adjudicate justice for humans while not seeing humans. And lastly, we believe that the economic systems must be based on just and moral ideals that represent equal distribution of wages and benefits, such that each person has a right to self-determination and actualization. This, we would say, is how you ensure healthy communities and, um, and basically the depletion of crime. So with that, I would just say that, you know, to keep this going, we need sustained activism, political pressure. We've been seeing this outside already. Um, you can do this through community activism um, and organizing, foregrounding the voices of the affected, sharing of knowledge around abolition and other liberating uh, literatures. Critical resistance has been my go-to place since forever. Um, Angela Davis's book I had in here already. I had Ruthie uh, Gilmore's book in there already. Um, and I have a list of other sources here that people can look at. This is by no means, right, exhaustive. So, but these are just some places that we could look to for um, information around abolition. Jason, I wanna go back to, um, to something you've alluded to throughout your presentation. That is the economic impact of all of this. So yes. I know that um, well, I'll guess in, uh, for example, our jurisdiction in Kentucky, uh, it costs between twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a year to keep uh, one person in prison, um, and and I think that is more than two times the amount that's being spent to educate one child in the public school system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, have you have, have you discovered that the economic disparities um, are prevalent throughout the um, correctional system in our uh, jurisdictions across the country? Yes, yes. I mean, th well, the one slide in which I posted up uh, the economic disparities by race and gender, I think more than uh, substantiates where you're going with this question here, right? And it kind of goes to the second part in laying the case, right? Because I felt like I was like prosecuting the case for you all. But in laying the case that um, the prison industrialization complex serves a very peculiar function in keeping the status quo. And by that, and, and in foregrounding your question, in terms of like sort of racialized social control here, right? So almost ensuring that these individuals here will not have a chance to participate in our broader society or in our democracy writ large. And by, and, and, and by the way, we're willing to pay <laughs> to ensure that. So instead of investing in educational systems, community-based systems within these communities, we will intentionally, you know, and this is what abolitionists will say. We, in, we, we say that it is an intentional investment in prisons over schools, as opposed to the more moderate or far away conservative exclamation of, well, this was just an unforeseen consequence, right, of bad policy that we now admit we shouldn't have done, right? But when you triangulate this against historical policy, historical procedure, and just historical um, lived reality and experience of African Americans, this has always been the sort of, you know, this has always been the program. This has always been the regime, right? Um, this is why we had to have the Brown versus Board of Education case. Right? This has always been the regime, if you will, onto certain populations in our country. And um, I think a way to get people to kind of see this more, Dean, would be through the pocketbook, as you just said, right? Is that the economic fallout. In other words, the state is wasting all of our money, all of our money. And the money is going towards really just holding people in these prison cells that is likely making them and the rest of us 
badly, badly sick. And let's not forget the COs, right, who often have to work within those confines with those um, inmates. Thank you. I'm taking a deep breath. Wow, Dr. Williams, thank you. Thank you so much. You have um, offered so much, not just for us to chew on, right, but to, um, to inspire us also to ask the critical questions at every, every single level. Um, from, <laughs> from the policing system into the jail and prison system, into the reentry system, into back reentering re society, our parole and probation, um, all of those pieces being um, critical thinkers yes. around um, the issues that are at hand and the why. Yes. Why do we have systems set up the way that we do? Um, we didn't, we're working on um, grabbing some questions from the, the Q&A, but as I'm pulling those, what I want to ask then is, um, and we only have a few minutes. Um, now that we have been educated, what suggestions do you have for members of congregations or faith communities in terms of getting involved in the process? What yeah. advocacy or action efforts might we engage in? Yes, yes. So I think first and foremost, I will go back on this slide here. Or when the slides go up, you can definitely go back through. But I think first digest additional materials and knowledges around what is going on, right? The racial disparities and so forth and so on. Um, I did state on that one slide, like the various different organizations that work around some of these issues. You can get involved with those organizations, you know? Um, I think that's the first thing we can do is get involved in our community with organizations that are doing work around these issues. Um, put yourself out there, you know, you can also donate. There are some individuals that might not be able to involve themselves. They're differently able, so they can't get out there and, you know, do the, the hands-on work. Donate. A lot of these organizations that are actually doing work in the community with returning citizens, they're not funded well, right? And so you can look at that list I provided and you can donate to even to some of them, or you can do some research about those organizations that might exist at the even local level right where you live and donate to them and to keep the conversation going um i think for a lot of us sometimes you know we'll come to these talks right we'll we'll, we'll engage with one another but we don't keep them going hold little informational sessions in your own communities or in your own families right now we have zoom and if you don't have access to zoom you have google hangout Right, so you can be holding these little informational sessions on your own as well, where you're constantly sort of pushing out this information. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, one more question and then I'll share a comment that came in as mm -hmm. well. Um, the question is, um, I teach uh, restorative justice and corrections. How can we advocate penal abolition and making the criminal justice system more restorative to people who are the most impacted? And, and, and teaching it. Yeah, I would say through the narratives of those who've been there and done that, you know, um, I, I'm a part of the American Society of Criminology, and I'm happy to see that there's now a division, right, that represents people who've been there and, and done that. Um, but through the narratives, I think, you know, and, and being someone who does research around returning citizens, I will say in my own classes, when I'm able to use narratives from people who've been there, done that, I can see a paradigmatic shift in my classes around people's understanding. Okay. Again, on the one hand, yes, the quantitative effect, right, the numbers are important to show a certain level of institutionalization and such. So we definitely, we, we need that context. But what's missing in much of this. Again, are the heartfelt, human, deep impact, like I mentioned, in, in the crevices that we have not even discovered yet, right? What's missing are those knowledges. And if we can somehow find that, right, and, 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 and humanize that and get people to see that, I think, I think you'll be on your way in that particular class. And I don't know if you're already using that in class, right? But for me, I found that to be most effective in my classes. And you can contact me afterwards and we can talk more about it, if anything. Um, one last comment. And then there's a question, Dean, um, that I'm going to pitch over to you uh, via um, email. 
Um, and that question is, do you know of any small group uh, study material, video, and workbooks that incorporate biblical principles with this material to use in our church setting? Um, so we can create a resource list um, uh, for our attendees. When we post this on our website, we can include um, some, it will certainly include all of the resources that Dr. Williams has listed. You've seen them come up in the chat, but um, any additional resources that Dr. Williams has and, um, and Reverend Callis has for us, we can um, upload those as well to our website um, linked with this uh, webinar. So I want you to know that I, I see your question and we will make sure that we provide some materials. That final comment and then um, Dr. Williams, uh, you get the final final, final word, whatever, <laughs> however you want to close that portion out. Um, our attendee said, I take some issues with the use of the uh, re words, um, for instance, reintegration or rehabilitation. Since so, so many of the incarcerated, and especially those who are non white and non heterosexual males, have never been integrated or habilitated within majority uh, culture in the first place. And so I'll let you um, comment mm -hmm. um, and, and close us out with your, your final comment. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I'm, I'm, I'm using terminology just within the context of the sources that I shared, but I agree with that. In fact, um, this is something that some of the articles that I, coll uh, that I collected in my special issue argued, right? I, did, I recently did a special issue around prison and reentry and whatnot. And so I agree with that, right? And that's essentially part, part and parcel of my second point, right, of the racialized social control mechanism that the prison plays as well, which further exacerbates some of those racial issues, right? So when you're telling me, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking of something that, um, um, Garcia Hallett's article mentioned with the with the black woman in particular coming home right and being told that they have to reintegrate but how do you reintegrate into a society that wasn't built for you a society that didn't right so that's part of our intersectional uh, understanding you know, right of this very issue and which is also why it needs to be abolished because it doesn't account for those differences as I mentioned in my closing out pieces here wonderful um, first of all, let me thank you to our participants for, um, for engaging us today. We are at our time. Um, and I, I do see your questions still coming in. Again, we'll capture those and we'll share those back to Dr. Williams and Reverend Bucalis um, for a response via um, email. Um, if you are able and willing to put your email in the chat, in the Q&A, please do. If not, um, we'll be able to pull that from the registration list and be able to share those responses back to you. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Williams, um, for just a, um, I mean, you gave us a, a, a feast of information um, and, and an encouragement for how we might move forward um, together on these particular issues and why we need to be um, reflecting uh, so critically on these particular issues. My friends, this does end our webinar today. Um, we wanna thank you for your time. We want you to consider the ways in which you, your congregation, your communities might get involved or further your ministries and work in addressing prison and jail related issues. Today's webinar recording, as I mentioned earlier, will be available on the MBA website soon for your convenience. So please share this resource with others. The MBA hosts regular webinars with topics related to prison and jail ministries, mental health and wellness, social entrepreneurship, and leadership and organizational development for health and social service ministries throughout the year. So please check the MBA website for more information on upcoming educational opportunities and for registration information. To get connected to the MBA Prison and Jail Ministries work, please uh, feel free to email Dean Bucalis at Prison Ministries at mbacares.org, or you can visit our website as mentioned earlier, nbacares.org. Remember also to like MBA on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and visit our MBA webpage for more information related to Disciples Health and Social Services and Disciples Justice Ministries and a host of resources. Thank you so very much, and we hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you.